Michael Hill, you don't know me. My name is Brian Moyne. I'm a second year resident of Infectious Disease. Today I'm here to talk to you about what I think is a very exciting topic. And I hope by the end you will understand why it's a very exciting topic. So it's matrix assisted, matrix absorption, ionization, time of flight, mass phenomenon, or known as multiple. So that topic you learned about, organic chemistry, probably puts you to sleep. You actually have a machine in the micro lab. It's going to be rolled out in the next couple of months. Help identify where it is it's faster. And although you may be thinking, hey, why is anything they're doing in the micro lab affecting me on the floor? On this intervention, on the results have been shown to you. increase mortality, increase cost, and increase length of stay. So we all know the standard of care for infectious diseases, such as pneumonia or sepsis, is to get appropriate antibiotics. When you have an error antibiotics, we're just guessing. What's our best guess of what's going to cover what these patients have? And sometimes we're right, sometimes we're not. And to try to be right, we get broad spectrum antibiotics. And giving broad spectrum antibiotics can increase the number of some In 2013, the CDC came out with a landmark report saying that at least 2 million infections and 23,000 deaths every year are caused by antibiotics. So we've kind of got a balance, making sure patients get appropriate antibiotics quickly, but trying to get those antibiotics off is the broad spectrum narrow as quickly as we can. So that's where rapid diagnostics come from. You know, how they do things in the micro lab downstairs, identifying organisms off the plate, filing off the test, hasn't really changed in 100 years. But now with all different types of rapid diagnostic tests, using the CR, different biomarkers, but probably the biggest one that's coming out is multi So it's a rapid diagnostic technique, which is mass spectrometry, to characterize bacterial proteins into a fingerprint. And that fingerprint is identified through a database that says, this fungal protein is E. coli, this fungal protein is pseudomonas. So it all starts from a positive culture plate. So you can't do it from a positive one culture, but you got to ask them Steps. You've got a culture plate, and instead of spending a day, a day and a half doing a different biochemical test on it, just pick up a cult uh, colony, stick it on the steel plate and the Molotov axe, add a little bit of matrix on it, stick it in the machine, the Molotov gets into the laser, ionize the proteins, and those pieces of proteins fly down the time of life. So you're still going to go to the battery. charge the speed which they get the detector and get a report and that report the machine uses to identify the bacteria. So instead of taking maybe a day and a half, two days to go from gram negative rods to E. coli, you can come in 20 minutes from gram negative rods to E. coli. And that is explained in that diagram down there. Um, it's a, it's a, a thousand words on the side of the picture. There's also the next figure that talks about um, kind of how this fits into the process. So again, you still got to get growth from a culture, and we can identify the organism. We don't get susceptibility faster. We just get organism identification faster. And that's that figure too. So this has been implemented by other academic medical centers. We talked about two studies, one at the University of Michigan, one at these methods, where um, using all these often and antimicrobial stewardship respond to those results vastly improved patient outcomes. So both of these studies are quasi-experimental, including in those patient studies where you have, this is what happened to the patients before we got the machine, and then after we got the machine, these are the outcomes. And both of these studies had stewardship intervention on these results. Because previous studies have shown that it's important, you know down in the lab, a day and a half earlier, that that's equal to one. That really doesn't affect patient care. You've got to get somebody who can convey those results to the physician and be able to make recommendations based on what's going on with the patient. So, Wong et al. at the University of Michigan performed this study pre and post implementation. The first implementation was September to November 2011, post to September to November 2012, on all positive blood cultures with stewardship recommendations. And they have um, from 6 a.m. to 11.30 and 24-7. So the 
study included 256 patients in the pre-intervention period, 245 in the post-intervention period. And so the time to emergency identification was quicker, uh, 84 to 55 hours. Less than zero. Time to effective antimicrobial therapy after the culture was positive also <coughs> by about 10 hours. ICU length of stay decreased significantly in patients who were in the ICU. And mortality decreased significantly from 20% to 12.7% post intervention. But again, that's just one study looking at all positive blood cultures. Another hospital will look closer to us. <coughs> at a different subset of patients in a similar study style, quasi-experimental. Patients that had multi-drug resistant gram-negative products were that their blood. It's either PSPL, E. coli, or yellow, or pathogens that only were susceptible to antibiotics and two classes. So they had a little bit longer pre and post implementation period from January 2009 to November 2011. It's a pre implementation <coughs> February 2012 to June 2013. Again, you know, my focus version here was on call on the hours a day, seven days a week. So the study included 157 patients, pre intervention arm, 112 patients in post intervention arm. The time to identification decreased uh, very significantly from three hours to 14.5 hours for identification. And again, we're talking about patients affected with multiple drugs and scenario products. So the vast majority of these patients in both periods were not on effective therapy. On antibiotics that work against that and cause the infection. But the time to initiation of accurate significantly reduced the patients in the post intervention period from 89.7 to 30 in two hours. So they got them on accurate 60 hours worth. It's like two and a half days. It's crazy. And the rapid identification uh, plus solution medication increased 30 day mortality in these patients with more purposes and preventative factor increases. And they also had uh, a big impact on length of stay in hospital rooms. Length of stay in survivors decreased from 23 days in the pre-intervention period to 15.3 days in the post-intervention period. And hospital charges for each patient survivor increased by an average of $26,000, leading to an estimated cost of $2.4 million. And so, got this machine downstairs. We're still working on implementation of it without any machine uh, working out how all this data is going to be transmitted to Epic when they're going to run the machine that's coming. So this is an exciting rapid diagnostic technology. It's been used to other institutions to save lives, save money, increase mortality, increase the day. And all of these um, great outcomes. But it's all dependent having somebody act on those results, knowing what to do with the results. So we're not going to know the um, susceptibility of these low expenses. We're just going to know the awareness of the patient. But our hospital, and most hospitals have what's called an antibiotic. Um, it's available on the pharmacy website, which has susceptibilities of organisms we've seen in the previous year. So using that, along with the awareness of identification, optimize their quicker and save lives and save money for these patients. Um, probably um, one of the cool exciting things they did uh, also at the University of Michigan was they looked you know, how many times do we dose maximize the patients who wanted to positive blood culture for grand positive toxin. It turned out to be quite a negative stat. Turned out to be contaminant. We're just waiting to see if that's really staffing the They're getting a couple days when they that's one example. We can fast forward by identification for 20 minutes instead of waiting for two and a half days to see if that's the right way to that. Did that make a nice and stop? And so, again, uh, that's just one example. There are many examples of this organism identification fast. We have you guys uh, take recommendations to optimize how we grow with their Any questions? So, I thought the Michigan method of experience is whether they had really robust stewardship response. What was their stewardship involvement in the pre intervention? Were they getting alerts of the alerts as far as the normal process to allow before the molly call? Were they involved 
that in, you know, that much with those results beforehand, just at a later date, or was, was that a different too? So in Michigan, they were just reviewing data reports of certain targeted antimicrobial cycles, like that reminds me of some things of that nature. They weren't um, responding to cultures. I'm not the Houston study to talk about what they did pre intervention. But again, you know, most places didn't have a robust response to these cultures before because you know, all of these biochemical tests you know, take time. Most of them are done on the first shift. So if you're just getting close results between eight and five, why do you need to have somebody on the call? So other question I'll leave you alone. What cultures would you say were, were good candidates to get with the all calls? What type of specimens? So you can use anything from a plate. You can put down a culture, but you can only go directly from a blood culture. Um, you know, stuff like a sputum. You know, there's five or six different types of bacteria in there just from normal respiratory form. So after you've got something culture out on the plate, you can pick out anything. Um, now exactly how we're going to implement it and what cultures we're going to do it from, still it's being worked out that way. So everyone drinks the quality of way. What are some limitations to the test? So what like what bugs might it not work? Um, so again, it just categorizes bacterial protein. So stuff that's close, like Shigella, E. coli, doesn't do as well. Um, different types of strep, um, can't tell the difference between. But again, it's been shown to work better um, in current mobile biochemical test for those things. What about yeast? I know we can identify yeast, I'm not. What limitations are with all these perspectives? Yeah, they're so they've got. Excuse me for interrupting. How long are we all supposed to have this frame? Wow, until one. Okay. Wow. We're going to use these five minutes. Right. <laughs> uh, no, so yeast, you've got to do an extra step to destroy that cell wall, ideally. Because even still, you get low scores. So there's. There's a lot of flux right now. What do we do? What's the perfect step for a yeast to hold that we don't have? I mean, the biggest, why is it, why did we this machine four years ago? Why is it never off the tree? Is the capital cost of this machine somewhere around 250 to 500,000 to run around? So it saves money long term hospital costs, but in the era of silo budgets, microbiology budgets can go with lunch. Savings, they'll save a little bit because they want to do a bunch of biochemical tests, but most of the savings are going to be like you say. So, since you brought up the savings, and I agree with Travis on this Google Aid thing, what would you change about our stewardship program now that we have this capital investment? So, you've got to have somebody on call to respond to results. Um, and all that's going to depend on how many times a day you actually run them all the time. Because, again, that's another step micro lab and that work was a little worked out. But I mean if we have this machine, they're getting results, you know, seven days a week, and you know, we're not working. And it's just sitting down in the lab, you know, it's all about getting information to the right person at the right time. Um, so as a rounding pharmacist, if I were to you know check a culture before, you know, check my culture results before I go in, what drugs I guess would I give de-escalate faster using this multi-top, especially since it can't tell me susceptibilities. So like where am I going to see the most de-escalation opportunities? Probably the biggest is from um, if you know, somebody's super sick, we always want to worry about covering for pseudomonas. But if it comes back to the line, let's change that maritone to maybe some rise. So pseudomonal coverage would probably be the biggest thing. And I, I might tend to disagree with that. I think more if you don't isolate gram positive, you can get the banco off um, first. But the gram negative, in my experience with Molly, what I've seen is that even if it is an E. coli, physicians will tend not to de-escalate off of a cephalopenem or a meropenem until the resistance pattern is proven, especially when our gram negatives are becoming more and more resistant to therapies that are currently available. So that might not be as beneficial as we would have liked it to have been. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll pick it back on that point. I think that's a great point. The key here is you want actionable information to high yield. And so we keep talking about bug a few times. Bug holders are a good example. They're all they're very, very commonly monomicrobial. So if you get a result that's very positive, you start thinking about getting rid of negative recovery. Be careful with the escalated frequency though. You don't want to send anybody up. You know, always the sickness of the patient is bigger than that. If that patient's critically ill, you really want to wait until that's a good result back. Before it's going to happen. Take these results and try to